Good evening, everybody. What a wonderful room to be in on this lovely summer day. Honourable Dr. Abhishek Singhi, Singhi, our dear friend and colleague, Professor Raj Kumar, esteemed guests and my dear colleagues, on behalf of the University of Southampton, and especially from our President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Kingsley, may I extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you for joining us today. My colleague and co-host, Professor Andrew Atherton, Vice President, couldn't make it today due to unforeseen circumstances. And he's asked me to convey his warmest regards and apologies to you, Dr. Singley, and to colleagues who have assembled here. We're absolutely delighted and honoured to host Dr. Singley together with O.P. Jindal Global University, an institute of eminence where we cherish our long-standing partnership. As you all know, Professor Raj Kumar, the Rhodes Scholar, founding Vice-Chancellor and founding Dean of Jindal Law School, has been a magnum force in driving innovation and positive change in the higher education landscape across India and globally. Raj, an enormous thank you to you today for having us co-host today's important event. The very young um, 20th century. So I'm a founding member of the UK Russell Group Research Intensive Universities and a founding member of the Worldwide Universities Network. The University of Southampton is proud to be consistently ranked in the top 100 of the world. Not many people know this, and that's because we don't shout enough. So I'm learning, Professor, but we'll be a little bit more uh, loud and, and proud, shall we say. Okay. But as some of you may know, in the most recent UK Research Excellence Framework, the REPS 2021, an amazing 92% of research conducted at the University of South Anthony was rented world needed. That's full star. I don't And 97% was internationally excellent for world class. So we just add another fight, the same fight. And we became fourth, we were ranked fourth in the Russell Group for impact, demonstrating the real world benefit of our research. Our strategy follows the triple helix approach, which brings together education, research, enterprise, and knowledge exchange in a holistic manner with people at the core. India is our highly valued strategic partner country, and we have a well established track record a multidisciplinary portfolio of research, education, enterprise and knowledge exchange with India the institution for over the last 25 years. And I had the honour of visiting O.P. Jindal, I think nearly a decade ago now. When, um, so it's high time that I went back. I'm waiting for my invitation, Raj. In 2019, the university established our India Centre for Inclusive Growth and Sustainable Development to further affirm our long-standing engagement with India, engaging a, a range of internal and external stakeholders, including government ministries in India and the UK, through the Indian High Commission here in London and the British High Commission, and industries to support, strengthen and deepen the UK-India bilateral relationship. The India Centre has been successful in building relations with our partner institutions and key stakeholders facilitating knowledge exchange and enabling high-impact research and enterprise. In 2020, we launched a university-wide curriculum innovation interdisciplinary course on time emerging and resilient in India. And this gives the opportunity for any student enrolled in the university, regardless of their discipline, to take this course and become informed about the key challenges and opportunities in India, which will be the leading country for the 21st century. So we owe it to all our students to give them that opportunity to understand uh, this amazing country. And I'm happy to say the course has become one of the most popular elected courses in the university. I think in part due to the wonderful professor Sabu Pagwadas who is not here today, but sends his best for gone. So now I'll let you turn to the agenda of today. And I now invite Professor Raj Kumar to introduce our honourable guest and the distinguished lecture. Thank you. Great. 
a very lead to our drill, um, not to follow an and a warm welcome to all of you to this uh, distinguished public lecture by Dr. Abhishek Manu Singh, jointly organized by the University of Southampton and Oti Jindal Babal University. Um, I have uh, my real privilege to uh, also support extend our dearest uh, greetings and congratulations to the extraordinary achievements of the University of Southampton. Um, Jane mentioned that um, she's learning to be um, loud and proud uh, from us. You know, Jane, um, all I can say is that if you are located in a place called Sonipat, not a very municipal village in the rural part of Haryana, and you are out there and wanting the world to know you, there is no other option but to be loud and anti to <laughs> <laughs> You need to be even more louder to be heard. But um, all I can say is that uh, our relationship with South African University has been phenomenal. And this is one more example of a joint initiative that we have promoted here. I want to extend my obvious greetings and congratulations to both Professor James Falkingen as well as Professor Lana Shores and indeed the Vice Chancellor and Sabu and my very dear friend um, Amarjeet Singh, who, besides being the chairman of the India Business Group, also a Arjun Professor at the General Global Business School. Uh, before I formally introduce Amishek Manusingvi, who wasn't mean much of an introduction, uh, I, want to, I want to recognize some extraordinary people in the audience, beginning with Sohail Seth. Uh, Mr. Seth is a true public intellectual and somebody who has always spoken truth to power in India. And we are very fortunate that he has been in this uh, situation in London. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, last time, when uh, we hosted the Honorable uh, Dr. Justice Chandra Chu, uh, it so happened that he was a man mentioning studies across multiple words and multiple identities. And today, we are very fortunate that he is here. Thank you so much for your very presence. I want to recognize the presence of another extraordinary man by name, um, Chris Parsons. For the London audience, all I can say is that Chris Parsons is a force of nature, chairman of the India uh, practice of uh, Herbert Smith. That's only one part of it. He's, uh, he's a lawyer. But what Chris has done uh, for India and for public causes is extraordinary, amazing. He has done uh, twice uh, marathons to support the cause for widows and children in India. Uh, initially, he did one as a part of the Rumba Foundation, uh, walked from Mumbai to Bangalore. And then more recently, I had the privilege to host him in Kanyakumari, which is my hometown. And he did a marathon from Kanyakumari to uh, Srinagar. Uh, and he walked all through the uh, entire distance of India and raised money for the cause of uh, widows as well as uh, things that were. It is my real lot. The brother is singing with the man. We are a lawyer, uh, make your money, but uh, live a life like Fickles Parsons, making so much of difference uh, to humanity. Uh, India, he is not an Indian, he has no other connections with India, but he just fell in love in the country and wanting to give back, and that's what he has been doing. I also want to recognize the presence of Rajesh Radhavan, uh, Principal Consultant of the Tata Consultancy Services. TCS doesn't need any introduction, has been a great uh, uh, company, but also a truly remarkable institution, which is the Tatas. I also want to recognize the presence of my friend, uh, Trustmits of the Mishra, a leading lawyer in India and founder of the Trust in the Firm. My two colleagues, Professor Srinjit Executive Dean of the General Bobo Law School, Professor Karan Latian, the G. Proctor and Professor at the General Bobo Law School, and Manu uh, Shanunga Sundara, who was a leading lawyer and also part of the uh, uh, you know young brigade of lawyers in India from the Madras High Court. So I could mention all the names, but I'm very delighted to offer the end here. I want to specially recognize the presence of my very dear friend, Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Winston, uh, the Judge of the Supreme Court of Hawaii, and recently retired. I'm also honorary adjunct professor at the Little Book Law School for his presence. All right, um, today is a very special day. We have Dr. Abhishek Manu Singh B, who, for our friends in London, I must tell you that if you really want to uh, meet him and spend some time with him, it's going to be a very expensive affair. Uh, nothing I can add for you. Uh, but we are very fortunate that Dr. Sayamit has um, accepted our invitation to be here in London, Oxford, and Cambridge. And he has given a beautiful talk today in the morning at the City Law School. And he is, of course, here at the University of Southampton and the General Cambridge. Now, uh, all I can say is that I've had the privilege to meet many lawyers, but he's one of the sharpest human beings, minus a legal mind that I've ever met. 
his ability to grasp complex issues and to articulate in the most impactful and compelling and persuasive manner is, um, uh, is truly remarkable. Uh, besides that, he is a workaholic. He tirelessly works and makes significant contributions to the world of law and justice. But something that is less known uh, to the world at large is that he is an extremely generous man, a magnanimous man, a true philanthropist. He has instituted several scholarships and fellowships in several institutions. He has made significant causes as a member of parliament. He has uh, made God out of the way and made contributions towards numerous causes that have directly impacted the lives of ordinary people. Um, his uh, philanthropic contributions have also been in his alma mater at the University of Cambridge and also at Open Fleming Global University, where we centered the same we end went as well. So we are very, very fortunate that we have, again, an extraordinary lawyer with a very strong commitment to humanity and social causes who is here with us. Um, I also want to mention that uh, our university's journey in many ways entwines with the kind of support and um, uh, and a great degree of uh, encouragement that we have received from uh, institutions in this country. Uh, I want to recall that in 1998, I was a student at the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. I had the privilege to get that philanthropic contribution of the Rhodes Scholarship, which enabled me to study in this country. But I dreamt about I.P. of Building University as a 24-year-old student in 1998. That journey took me afterwards to Harvard Law School, where I did my master's, then worked as a lawyer in New York. And the next decade, I taught in Japan and then in Hong Kong, and I wrote a paper entitled Established in India's First Global University, got to meet with an Indian benefactor, William Naveen Jindal, in the year 2006, persuaded him for a year to do three things, one, to make a substantial financial commitment, second, to do it in a not-for-profit manner, and third, to let me have the academic freedom, autonomy, and independence to build the world class university in India, by late 2007, he agreed to our outfit, and early in 2008, I moved to India, and we started in a very modest manner, with only 100 students, 10 full-time faculty members, four classrooms, and one office space for me, the 10 faculty members, and the 20 administrative staff in a then 50-acre campus with only 100 students and one school, the Jindal Global Law School. 14 years later, we are now a larger community with over 10,000 students from 60 countries, over 1,200 faculty from 50 countries, over 12 multidisciplinary schools in a 100 acres campus with uh, now over 8,000 alumni spread around the world, including in the city of London, where I hosted an alumni meet and dinner where 75 of our alumni turned up. So this journey, I want to acknowledge, would not have been possible but for the extraordinary faith and trust that so many individuals and institutions have put on us. And one such institution is the University of Southampton. And I want to pay my debt of intellectual gratitude to the University of Southampton, including my very dear friend, Sabu, who was not present here, but I know his spirit is very much here, who made significant efforts to put this event together. With those words, I have great pleasure in inviting Dr. Abhishek Manusingvi, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, Member of Parliament, the Alpert House of the Parliament of the Rajya Sabha, to deliver his distinguished public lecture on India 75, the future of law and justice in the world's largest democracy. Thank you. Professor Jane Kassingham, Vice Chancellor Raj, Professor Schultz. Each of the names which Raj took, may I warmly welcome at college, my good friend, Soviet State, who adds to the intimidation of an ordinary intimidating audience of academics. Yeah. Recently in time, Judge Mike Wilson, distinguished academics, Above all, the co-hosts, Jindal and Southampton University, two great institutions, joined by great goals, great ideas, and great dynamism. And you just heard the statistics. They are staggering. I am myself seen the pictures of when Jindal started. It was almost a blank landscape. And to imagine that in the paint or cream that you have it in 40 years, that I think this is something which is mind-boggling. But friends, the topic I today 
uh, is EBI 75, the future of law and justice in the world's largest democracy. And it has the word future. So I am reminded that sometimes it's not a great idea to think of the future. Yes. As Albert Einstein said, and I never think of the future because it comes soon enough. But the better than was seen in vice is that of Abraham Lincoln, who said that the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. And therefore, let us, and this is of course as wide a topic as can be, you know, so I'm going to roll up a fine dancer, touch upon the parts of the topic without really covering anything. But he told us that we'll have some uh, useful interaction afterwards. But it is an important and interesting uh, topic for a democracy that nascent, very, very young, recently born democracy in 1947 and 50, and to look back and then to look for the future at the future. But let me start as I've done many times with a simple question about it with Indian audiences and American audiences and different British audiences. And I, since this is a different audience, I don't mind doing it again. Uh, a simple, perhaps oversimplistic question, uh, which is that why is it that India, of all countries, out of possibly 25, 20, 30, 35 odd countries, emerging from the yoke of imperialism, roughly between the 30s and the 60s, why is it that India alone, and certainly India, a country of this size and diverse, has remained a vibrant, thriving democracy? I didn't know of no other emerging ex-imperial country which has managed and got enough wrecks and ruins of our institutions, uh, littering the landscape of South Asia, littering Australasia, littering Africa, South America, all from Spanish imperialism, English imperialism, Belgian, Dutch, colonialism, Portuguese colonialism. Not one, and certainly not one, there may be one or two exceptional race on sides, and certainly none but the size and diversity of India. So when I asked this question, I asked myself, I have no answer. I generally have no answer. The first answer I give, which I'll leave for you, is sure, good luck. And that's an honest answer. The second more reasoned response would be that, again, of course, by God's will and good luck, we perhaps got the sequencing right. We got the sequencing of Nehru after Gandhi and not vice versa. They could perhaps, you know, better persona than Gandhi to have got independence after many, many years with minimal violence. And he was a gigantic pillar who screwed, screwed like in Colossus. But what is important when you look at India at 75 is not Gandhi, who alone could have got us independence in the matter we paid. But Nehru, who was, and we were fortunate, that he was perhaps the best suited person to lead this nascent democracy. Nehru had many things, possibly carried dispensation, but he had only a feeling. But certainly he had treatings, as there are very few people who would not. But even his worst critics cannot deny that he was a true democrat in spirit, in thought, in need, in action, in spirit. Even if a somewhat left of center, romantic, over idealistic, ever trusting Fabian socialist. But still, uh, the Spirit of democracy suffused his entire being. And he did epitomize what Dares we would say, that I will disagree with everything you say, but I will defeat to death your right to say it. That Nehru lived long enough was the other icing on the cake. That he lived long enough and therefore was a bit of the unexpected and rare bonus our neighbor Pakistan had devices in both Liakab and uh, Jinnah very early on, and so the others did. Uh, it was an icing on the key because it allowed several non-institutional pillars in Indian democracy and several institutional pillars in Indian democracy to take root in those first 17, 18 years of this prime ministership. And that was a benefit which other South Asian countries did not get. And before I turn the brief to all of this, is not a, a 
as I said, any one of those pillars or the topic of all these pillars can by itself be a full lecture. So I'm not certainly going to speak on them in PK. But before I touch upon that, I sometimes wonder about the reverse sequence. Nehru followed by Gandhi. And the answer would be a respectful no. Because Nehru, with all his intellectual and all his other skills and his belief in democracy, you could never have got us in the lens. And Gandhi, the excessively idealistic, reclusive, inflexible, morally obstinate person that he was, would never have been able to manage the pulls, the pressures, the compromises, and the flexibilities required to run the new nascent democracy called India in 1947 and 1950 when we got our constitution. So we've got this perfect secret sauce, this Jubal Bandi, in the right sequence. And that is the only answer I can give for this duet of reasonably good harmony and sing, which has, which has made India win. And there's quite a remarkable achievement, the only country emerging on that bunch of families. Let me, before I come to the more narrow, specific nitty-gritty deeds, touch upon this other topic of these, how you created this democracy by encrenching and, embed and embedding those major fundamental non-institutional pillars in the democracy. And then also, of course, the institutional pillars. But remember, the non-institutional pillars are usually more important than the institutional pillars you create. Clearly, the first of these is secularism. I call it non-institutional, also because it didn't find a place in our constitution as drafted. It came into the world and settled in it. But just imagine the most diverse spot on planet Earth. A spot where 22 scheduled languages, 700 mother tongues, 2,000 dialects, the birth of four religions, the birthplace, the third largest home to a very major minority, Muslims, third largest. More than 20 other Muslim nations put together. Um, a bewildering diversity of races, thousands, smells, foods, dresses, rituals, and noises. You cannot imagine whether you call it a silent bull or a venting pot. This is by far the most diverse spot on planet Earth. And in that, secularism is not a largesse, which we're building to any form of any pretty. It is actually a self preservating ethic. Uh, perhaps the best definition, and so much abused word, so much revived word, that current, currently it is almost uh, insulting to use the word secularism. But uh, one of the best definition I came across was that by Professor Raji Panula of our ex Harvard. He said that why did Lincoln use this famous space? We understand the violent people, we understand. Uh, for the people. Why did he say off to people? So it's the three of best to use. And then he goes on to explain if of the people is intended to convey a small little co ownership of democracy to every nook and cranny of the population which inhabits that region. And unless you are able to convey that sense of co ownership, co proprietorship of democracy, the sense of belonging, which is really another way of being a secularist, irrespective of creed, caste, power, etc., uh, you will have proper in a diverse spot, in a more uniform or uh, you know, singular, singular kind of a uh, profile. It would not matter if it would matter very much in diverse. The second non institutional pillar is one which is given primacy in our constitution or in our forgotten. Fraternity. This is a great word called fraternity. But there is absolutely very little attention paid to it. Again, conveys the same that the base of same concept of inclusiveness, plurality, to constitute the second major not institutional pillar in Indian democracy. The third is federalism. Very interesting. I did a Google search once on the Indian Constitution and threw up twenty odd word. 20 or times spectrum. And look carefully, and there's no word called federalism in the Indian Constitution. All the references of federal are to the federal court, which was the uh, precursor of being in Supreme Court. So there is no mention of federalism anywhere 
in probably the third or fourth largest constitution in the world, the institution. And yet, it is becoming a non institutional very good pillar of Indian democracy because it's a very vital vehicle to manage adversities. Uh, as somebody said, uh, federalism is a safety belt for the three Bs. It's a very good safety belt for dissent, for discomfort, and for dissatisfaction. It quarantines conflicts at local levels. It prevents conflagrations, exclusions at the center of it. And a separate fascinating story, which I have spoken out many times in separate independent single lecture, what he once had did it, is this fascinating story about how our founders broadly following the British system, which is allowed as we to use the get, with very few concessions to federalism. Remember, there were additionally some gain very much about the Fissi Paris breaking tendency of the Republic. So the British activity was unitary centered focus approach. The fascinating story, which must await some separate interaction, is how over the last 75 years, India has become mutually and along with steam war factor in operational reality than in conceptual design. And it's you can put this nice phrase of higher now accidental or in, inadvertent federalism. That was the third, the fourth pillar, non institutional again, of the democracy, are those two words, not one, parliamentary democracy. So we have parliamentary, uh, not presidential, not mere democracy. And just to boil the temple of democracy, is not enough, but we've been fortunate, largely, except for spew aberrations to have a parliamentary spirit. Parliament is not just a building or just an institution with dreams. For me personally, in my 17th year in Parliament now, I was asked once, which was the essence of parliamentary democracy. I said the essence is what we get in central oil in India. The two ladies in Bangladesh cannot sit in the central oil of Bangladesh Parliament. Mahar Sharif and uh, Zia al have will not sit in central oil of uh, the Pakistan Parliament. I am not sure what you call your central oil in India, but central oil in the Indian Parliament, uh, which is, of course, also additionally the world's biggest gossip spot, uh, uh, is the essence of democracy. You sit without your act to anarchy, you sit, the Prime Minister can come and walk in, the senior most minister sitting behind you, somebody else is sitting here, having cups of coffee and discussing everything, and that's suddenly there's a long rule which these young journalists don't remember now, but they were these two. Anything you say there is a pop to record, and they specifically tell the person this on the record. So that's the heart of of African democracy, and that is actually true in in uh, uh, in the Indian Parliament. I've supposed to qualify to regular, and I have been checked out here today. And this is my part, party boycotted the inaugural ceremony. But uh, I was horrified to, I uh, hope it's not true there, that there is no set to afford in the new parliament building. I'm sure they will be having some substitute, otherwise they will be revoked. Because uh, the two minor reasons you have it is it's the cheapest place to get good food. Right. And also it's a great person spot. Apart from these four non-institutional pillars of Indian democracy, there are several institutional pillars of Indian democracy, one of which of course the first four name virtue supported, uh cultivated. The other four he created and also natural. And that is the Election Commission of India, the Indian Army, the Controller and Auditor General, the CEG in Colin, and above all, was the both distinct, the press. So, and very early on in our constitutional history, that article which says freedom of speech and expression was read to be freedom of press. So, these are the other four institutional, visible, tangible pillars of Indian democracy. Time does not allow me to discuss them, uh, but this is the backdrop in which we have to look at 75 years of Indian democracy. And also, as we go to other themes now, remember that the threats to each of these pillars is always more insidious, is always more dangerous when it is covert, camouflage, indirect, not when it's a direct external threat. This brings us 
to obviously what is the biggest protector in democracy. And that obviously is the judiciary. And by judiciary, I mean the whole legal system, lawyers, justice, judges, courts. The importance of this institutional pillar of Indian democracy, which I did not mention in my list, perhaps may lecture these with that, cannot be possibly overemphasized. And today, it retains the highest trust quotient continuously, despite vicissitudes, despite a few aberrations. It retains continuously without interruption the highest trust quotient in 75 years of any other order of state. It's not necessarily only because of the virtues of the judiciary. It is more important to be because of the comparative lack of virtues in the other two orders. Uh, but, like it or not, it remains the all into which the entire nation turns in good times and in bad times. It is also the inventor of avant-garde doctrines, the cutting edge of innovation. The world's most activist court by far make Marbury and Madison blush. Uh, a court which has really no limits to judicial activism or judicial into in actual fact. A court which invented a doctrine which in one sentence is a permanent bulwark against constitutional dictatorship. In one sentence it says that a constitutional amendment can be unconstitutional if it violates the basic features of the New York Constitution. And what those basic features are will be outside in a case-by-case -case basis by judges, which means judges will have the last word. And already we had an impressive laundry list of basic features from democracy, one man, one vote, rule of law, uh, federalism, etc. So these are things, PIA, these are all inventions, coupled with a, as a collectivity, an institutional collectivity, with lawyers who have remained largely a ferocious and a fearless lot. Uh, there are, of course, individuals who are this way and that way, but they took a fire in the extreme, our fear sense, I was going to keep it in, uh, in a very positive way. So let me quickly highlight fine critical features of Indian democracy and their relationship to law and justice. This is a more particularized for law and justice to see for today. One, India became a constitutional democracy in 1947, actually a cultural democracy in 1915, to be precise, but the process began in 1947. And uh, it's, look, this Holland is captured very nicely by a very interesting global citizen, Australian, who brought it in, who got fascinated by the Indian Constitution, the Grabby Austin, who wrote this famous book on the cornerstone of the nation, on the Indian Constitution. And he said at the heart of this is the visionary, is the indelible faith in Indian nationalism, which the visionary founders espoused to deliver the promise of free will. And he said the main goal was to deliver social revolution. Of course, national unity and stability, but almost equally social re revolution. And he thought that the Constitution of India was above all a social document, not simply a political document. So that is the context in which you have to see this law, very comprehensive document. Because the basic object was to create a social revolution deal with disparities and, of course, keep India bound together as a nation amongst the physical tendencies reflected in partition. The second contextual backdrop here was that you had an institutionalization of democracy through elections, through the electoral process, because, uh, you know, there's no point saying, as, as Churchill said, for democracy it can be said, for elections, the women who worst form of representing democracy, but they are the best available alternative. There's no other alternative to say that Dubai and Kaidin elections. Most of the top dictatorship of the world have the state were in the title, democratic landman of so and so. So it's not the word which matters. We look at these figures. We are the first notes of our elections in our festival of democracy, which were in 51 and 52. A year after we bought the Constitution, and four years after we bought independence, 80 million people voted to choose 489 members of parliament, and about 1,800 odd people fought the elections. In 2019, the last election before the next year, 
in the Lok Sabha domain, lower house elections, 900 million eligible voters are for a way to vote. 900 million. 8,000 odd candidates and 543 odd MPs. As a reputed magazine put it, quote, said, India has come a long way, in the election will come a long way, from ballot papers to electronic voting machines, from camels and horses to cars and choppers, from telegrams to real-time mobile apps. Election processes evolved, political parties multiplied, logos switched, leaders elected and rejected, but one thing remained static, and that is the spirit of Indian voters to participate in this festival of democracy. That, I think, is a clear underpinning of the 75 years share. The third backdrop is how the constitution of India laid the foundation of rule of law. Rule of law, although in the traditional Dicean manner in which the Asians had it, rule of law in the latter context and larger sense. Of course, we have signed many uh, international treaties uh, since 1915, but our commitment Thus, these constitutional values of rule of law predate all of it. One of the best readings, even in free time, are the Muslim Assembly debates. And you start wondering how uh, this diversity of people representing a slice of India and macrocosm of India would sit for two and a half years and come out with this remarkable, eclectic document with over a million and a half people having been killed just a few months ago in the terrible carnage of partition and migration. And uh, though it's not a little too long, it is clearly an attempt to be a clarity. Three things they tried to do in this constitution. One is to find and design this complex, to find the equilibrium in this complex interplay of supposedly contradictory themes. But when they wanted social revolution, so we had the direct personal state policy, something which the Irish had brought. I love the English at all. It was an Irish one. And then you had the fundamental rights, so part three and part four, both seemingly contradictory, but they worked hard to get an equilibrium. And then that equilibrium was later on, of course, improved by the traditional interpretation. Then, secondly, there is a fundamental rights chapter which is in the TPT, unlike the old constitution in the TPT. It's not just a set of abstract declarations as the US Constitution. Uh, from free speech to right of assembly to right to do business, in this to educational institutions, minority rights, etc., as so linguistic freedoms. And that teach is borrowed by another set of specified reasonable restrictions. Again, the model is not like the US, where there's a declaration and then the judges are of the exceptions. And then fourth is layered by hundreds, interpreted by hundreds of judgments, which has been itself a fascinating exercise. To just give an example, to the right sounds too abstract, to give two examples. Article 14, which is probably the single most important article in Constitution, possibly even more important than Article 21, which is the right to life. 14 is the anti-discrimination article so framed by the original framers who had in mind discrimination, 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 none yet. And they framed this active discrimination that you cannot discriminate and you could make classification between him and me, but the classification must bear a reasonable nexus to the object for to be achieved. Otherwise, the classification is bad. Now, what is fascinating is that this happened in 50. In 74 onwards, they added a facet of anti-arbitrariness to the site, which was nowhere there, nor probably even kept of it, which meant essentially that arbitrary action, non-reasonable action, would be it. But again, they steered clear of following a due, due process. So third level of advancement in a case called Banegram Nani, as procedural due process, the proper passport case. So you, you kind of smother the due process, and I said in the morning lecture in the experts this day, that uh, the original phase in our constitution was due process. And when the constitute assembly deemed wait to draft it, went to concept many nations, including the US, and possibly by accident they met Frank Furter, who was disgusted with the phrase due process. 
in the US. So I said, do anything else, the do not use this pen here. Sure. So they used this Japanese face in Article 20 of the Japanese Constitution, accepted the borders with procedures established by both. But the interesting story here is that they smuggled in first as a third addition to Article 14 procedural due process. That you must have due process, though we call it procedure, because they still didn't want to acknowledge substantive. And then now, 2019 onwards, in the Triple Tarak case, in the Adan Turing case, in so many cases, especially by Justice Narayan Barabam, most outstanding intellectual judges of retired now, you have now full blown substantive due process. So we've come full circle, and whether we in Rao or try to study study or it is brave, I don't know. It's a very welcome addition to our children's problems. This is the evolutionary journey of 75 years. We started with something which is not even claimed off on the texture, and then you reach this. And then there is access to justice promoted, or rather the very existence of the Supreme Court has institutionalized rule of law. Access to justice is promoted by uh, various classics and features of the Supreme Court. Or three or four features I may quickly itemize here. One, the Supreme Court as an appellate and a constitutional court. It is a dual role. Actually, it's multiple roles. It has some origins in the judicial, also in some other ideological functions. But principally, it's an appellate court as much as a constitutional court. So it does the pedestrian, uh, landlord tenant, jet bouncing cases in a field. Where it also does the abstract constitutional principles in five judges, seven judges, and nine judge coordination. And there will be, and I was saying in the morning, a lot of demand that it should only be in constitutional court. It was creating to me yet. I personally believe that that's not right. One of the reasons, of course, there are many more reasons. This is not a very major reason, but this is one of the reasons. That there's this high trust quotient is because it touches the common man, the it results to itself the right to reject, lead to a plea. So it's not a direct appeal court. It has a lead to a plea, plead up. But having said that, it keeps in touch with the common man, which is one of the major reasons for the trust quotient being so high. It became an abstract entity at the corner of the rule dealing with abstract constitutional protections only. Perhaps I believe that trust quotient would suffer. Then there is the Supreme Court, the same Supreme Court as a positivistic court a phase when it began more deferential with a great reluctance to assert himself against the inside, timidity in the court. And that is the aftermath of the emergency period with the most famous or infamous Jabalpur case, which is the Indian equivalent of the Nilusijan Anderson or the Indian equivalent of the Great Scots of the USA. It is now ironically being overruled by the Chief Justice, overruling in particular his own father's judgment in that. There is then the Supreme Court as a human rights court, as a PI court. So this was in the phase when the Supreme Court began its post emergency quest for legitimation. So there was a period of, if I say not application, but dilution of its. Assertion, so they looked for that quest for legitimation, and then it became very activist. And uh, you have this most of PIs on everything under the sub. And uh, in the second part of that activist phase, we started focusing more and more on social issues, on equality, on transparency, on social justice. So you had expansive interpretations of the rights to information, the Sunlight Act, as the Americans called it. We want to explain the PIL. Uh, the public interest litigation of PI and some other invention like basic structure by Indian courts. A PIL is actually a no horse part, no procedure circumscribing system where real justice can be done. Basically intended for the poor and the disadvantaged who cannot approach the court in traditional formats and be critics of litigation. So it allows, for example, epistolar of age jurisdiction that a an active jurisdiction. It allows court to reach any part without the normal traditional rules of standing, the open stand I, you know, maintaining ability, etc. But it has been expanding much beyond that also because now corruption cases, maladministrative cases, civic uh, abdication, environmental cases, they all come under PI. 
We have a green court in every high court. And we have a virtual green bench in the Supreme Court. So these are all facets of PI that they have raised far beyond the original concept. The original PI which came in the late 80s was PI for only those who could not approach the court. Well, the court would act as the player uh, spectre on its own. That has gone far beyond now. Court refuses the PI to make them to deem basically with injustice wherever they see it. But these are all facets of activism. And and I said the social part of it is uh, transparency, then uh, disclosures, really all charters for disclosure of pending criminal cases uh, against those who seek public office or public life. It's a charter created in Dari Bakhor General. There's no registration. We're very intrusive personal and family wealth declarations. Corruption issues, very enhanced. Uh, I'm not taking the names of cases, those are just I have for person citations. Uh, cases where corruption and malignant is attacked. Um, social justice, the favors only created two categories, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, as those entitled to affirmative action. We call it India preservation. Uh, but court judgments, realizing that India is part of what diverse and has many more backward classes, has then drawn this as bend over backwards to justify and uphold uh, reservations for backward classes under articles of the Constitution, or stated at least in the articles by the famous. So these are all examples of social, economic, uh, political activism, but finally, all the that. And then finally, the Supreme Court is the fifth aspect as a liberal institution. So the privacy judgment, a lot of that, it would perhaps has come from the current Chief Justice, uh, rooted privacy, not recognized separately, textually, as a right in Indian housing. Now, we consider the right to life, the dignity, public spaces, whereas private spaces. Um, they have jealously and zealously guarded that turf about appointing judges for service. I suppose right and wrong is good and bad, but that's the way it is. Um, free speech has been given extended interpretations. Sedition has been traditionally reduced to ancient point. It exists in the fashion book, but reduced to ancient point ironically just before I came two weeks ago. No commission. As he was a strong report to write it, with the government repeatedly trying to distance itself from its own opposition, it's possible around me. Why? The numbers portend led from India in economic terms. Our demographic profile is less than 35 years from 9 50 million people. That's a huge number of people. 40 million students are studying in the Indian higher education sector. The literacy rate is now 80% from 12% when we became independent. We are supposed to be the third largest economy in 2027. Uh, our human talent is the bedrock for many, many areas in India and even more outside of India, including the two Silicon Valley's, not one, Bangalore and California. In 2022, 23 Indian startups in one year became the accounts, which is a world ranking of three. So it's a, it's a good ecosystem. But you cannot have a great optimistic look at future or justice and law without looking at a few negatives and limited time to realize I think that with time will be needed. The rapid operation of time is going to go up and shortly, right? That will be as short as possible. Three, first of all, would be three, four areas. One is the scourge of areas, this mountain of backlog. Second is how do we deal with integrity issues in the judiciary, with the transparent, efficacious, and a swift plan. And third is how to ensure continued judicial independence. On the first, areas, one of my favorite topics, on which I've been heard about for the last 20 years, the title of when you be with it. It's administration of justice issue by itself. Our most famous jurist, Nani Kualkiwada, said that our dedication process would be considered unnamely slow within a community of snakes. 
Bahrain and the Netherlands for litigation was to be entered in the Olympics as a sport. Uh, India would win. Well, in fact, it was long, long dead. They us the closest adult in, a, in time terms to a suit is eternity. Wow, that. What we're allowing is that with all the seminars, all the talks, all the initiatives, COVID has taken a toll. And we now have 41 million cases and an issue of 10 million straight in COVID times. But if three COVID was bad enough, 30 plus million cases, now it's 40 plus million. The reasons are many. Time doesn't permit you, but the obvious one is you can have all the hospitals you like, all the medical people, and the both doctors and concrete patients. At no point of time in India, 75 million is true. Has more than two thirds of his strength of high court changes connected to minimum trade. So we have our any for entry of 1.5 billion now. Uh, is he getting must be at least what fourth from that litigating public from that? Uh, we have only 1100 or high court judges. High court is the main function of dispute resolution, so two more is much narrow. 1100 at no time have we had more than two thirds, with one third in other words, so 75 is always the at any point in time. And for long periods, you cannot have. In the lower courts, the district courts, the trial courts, that figure is 25% out uh, of some 25,000 posts. There are other reasons we still do not have quantitative advance, quantitative assessment for the past without. We passed a lot of check bumps in some kind of clamor for by the nation. We now find that it's proggy all wishes. And now the parliament is taking over the game for Because when the law was passed 30 decades ago, no quantitative assessment of protection litigation was done. We now have in prison parliament as a parliamentary an IDC of being to be passed along with a financial assessment of how much it would cost to operate that will. But we do still have a litigation assessment, which is important. And that's proving in many cases in dowry debts, what we call core IKT and in check policing, are two areas where two areas alone constitute a huge fraction of the total areas. There are, of course, Problems of inconsistency. I would say we have 16 Supreme Court, but we have at least 10 Supreme Courts sitting in 16 court rooms. Because we all sit on bound to see back and scold. We sit in benches. And bench inconsistency reads, it leads to uncertainty of, and it breeds progeny. So this bench decides a case which after 10 years is corrected by another bench as being wrong. In the 10 years intervening, it has bred a project of hundreds of cases of the echo levels, which is foreign variation judgment, and that creates its own problem. We have not used ad hoc judges provision which we have in the Constitution. In England, you have done miracles with recorders at a very different level. Uh, but here in India, we have not used the power of ad hoc judges, tried and tested material without waiting for the turf wars to work out. Uh, in appointments, minimizing vacancies by having the tie chairs in appointing temporarily is adopted. We should use that more. And PBR, which is now picking up a lot, but again, there uh, is a far, far lesser than what we need. Uh, I mean, I really jumped with all these things. There are lots of fascinating statistics to tell you, but maybe some other time. The second is a clear field of cynicism. Uh, and a feeling of distrust about the mechanisms evolved to be with in trying to be shady in taking teachers. Because in an institution, if you have the maximum trust, and yet you know that there are bad apples there, you need equally a swift, fast mechanism of a reasonable confidence building uh, to have a, a look into that. And that we don't have. We have system what we call the in-house procedure. It is, however, very turgid dilatory, gross opacity, and considered very incestuous. So you need something more transparent, and you need more than that, a stated set of hierarchical penalties. So for smaller misdemeanors, warnings, chastisement, for bigger ones, suspension, and for even bigger ones, uh, non word deprivation of judicial work, etc., none of which we have. We have the, the atom bomb, of impeachment, 
which is an active month that still if it last 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 preserved and still become a so effectively it becomes non operational and non active. The third issue is tradition independence. Um, I we I was in fact the person who moved the re for making the cohesion different to abolish the cohesion and have an ashing the wish upon its condition. And that bill ironically received hundred percent vote in the lower house. And in my house it received ninety nine percent vote. With one percent. That kind of consensus is not available for any measure in it. It's a very fractured poverty here. And we had this. And this meeting was passed into law that overturned by the city who loved their own power. Point. But that's not the point. The point I'm making is today, if we were to try the same thing, nobody would pass that bill. And at the risk of uh, being distorted, saying that I'm speaking negative things about contradiction with the foreign soil, uh, which is now the new fashion penalty, that uh, your right to free speech steps uh, stops when you step onto a plane outside India. Um, I will say that uh, today, one feels thankful because the part of the point bridge also was subject to and made me misused and remains with the judges. Because for the first time in 30 years, a majority, single majority, single party government, and I'm sure any other government will do the same place. I'm not blaming this government. Feels that it needs more and more space and flexible the persons and the flexible the muscle of the British system, the executive and the registration in a single party majority. Are born to say. So the only third over on YouTube then, with some crest to see, is the judicial over. So to be ironically, just five years, something which still 100% voted by the I can guarantee to put it to today. Every non ruling party person would vote against a vote against the transfer of this appointment power available into the district. Why is that? Because there is no doubt, and there's no point putting you in the soil there, ostrich. There is a climate of sphere being created. There's a climate of retribution being created. Not that retribution says so, where they're going to you at shouting with the rooftops. But clearly, there are ways and means of sending messages, of being appointments, of obstructing elevations, of spoiling your career. And a message is sent to one person, it works for 20 other persons. I think that is the third and a very major uh, uh, challenge we must look out for. The times are changing. As Bob Biddle said, the times are changing in many ways as far as technology and the future is concerned. Uh, futuristically, we've done boxes of things, and this particular Chief Justice, and even a few before him, have done lots of really now a virtual court. He's, in fact, guilty of increasing our creed. That channeling lawyers like us officially do work, virtual work from Austria and Switzerland while they're holiday. That's a frank and pressure to China, maybe what other doing this well. And, uh, but that's the bar technology. Uh, you is um, 34,000 Supreme Court judges, but since the 1950s have been digitized. You have hackathons or new ideas for reforming the institution of justice. You have translations into many digital languages of over 3,000 important judgments. It's an ongoing process that have been done before. E-courts are, paperless courts, e-courts are growing. Uh, accessibility committees for disabling access to all courts along the Supreme Court is adopted. The trial courts. There are uniforms, you know, and such a standardization initiatives to make computerization more effective, and so on and so forth. So clearly, as I said, the times, they are changed. And there are going to be more and more robotic and artificial intelligence cases. In fact, I have a very interesting uh, Kafka kind of scenario in a future living mode, where I would very shallowly for a robot. Occasionally, the robot will be accompanied by doing being judge and sit with it. And mostly, the robot will be here. And then the automatic transition my algorithms get into it. And within half an hour, you'll have a judgment coming out as the rest of our appropriate judgment. Maybe supervised by another judge, but to the, that's a likely fee. And 
uh, you know, very more creative, futuristic uh, trends like crowdfunding, litigation. My client sitting there is it done. They're moving with insurance representatives. And then you have to transfer of those litigation guides into a portfolio. And then you might have creating and cleaning of that portfolio. These are all real things. And you might have a crowd funding this two risk guy. See, they also like me would be first asked to give their risk assessment before the insurance company picks up the tab of litigation. So these are all not too far away. Fortunately and thankfully, you are in my generation. You have those who have to suffer. I love you there. That's not good. Uh, Left me now, really in general, the end, but give me just a few minutes more. Um, three things, by the way, which I consider very great for our profession, which is at a personal level, my analysis, which will change since when I joined, and all for the very positive changes for the legal profession, by legal profession, I mean the directly of judiciary justice. One law in India was for many, many years, well after I joined, a refuge of last resort. You try everything, you say five exams, you'll be unsuccessful in two or three different locations, then it's your career to law. From an option, a refuge of last resort for almost two, to two, two decades plus, it has become an option of first choice. Of first choice, not second choice. Second, it has now more and more and more looks more and more inviting and more and more people are joining unconnected to law without fathers and uncles and ancestors in law. You might still pinpoint the one with the judge's son or a lawyer's son. They are diminishing in numbers. A large number of them are people totally integrated with law. People who have, um, who are architects, too, crew, medical, top doctors. I had an industrialist who I'm not even very industrialist to, uh, India come to my house and do this year to his son and uh, he said, I'd come here for a straight check quiz. He said, I'd come here to tell my, to you to tell my son why not to do law. And so he's in chair. Spreezy chair wants to do law. He's a big industrialist. He wants to send the marriage in the street. And the third is the uh, success of ladies. At all levels except the very top. Because I think the very top Moved up takes time when they started bait. But ladies are doing exceedingly well at every level, from just below the top to below that to middle and to lower levels. And these are three clear changes from when I joined and over the last 20 years. Um, well, threads, I have come to an end of this larger theme. But the fact that the Trust push, which is so high in the generation, is of course both edifying for the generation, but it is also steadily for democracy. In democracy, excessive over reliance in one or the other, and great cynicism and distrust in the two other roles, is itself a sudden in thought. And that is the fragility of the rule of law, which will also be underlined while you lord the other bark of the success of the law as a wreck in the remission sector. So I wish to say congratulatory backs of the bat. Even if I sound like a bit of a spoiler, this is to be kept in mind. Two of the thesis for that are the growing criminalization of I have the statis statistics here, which I will not bore you with. Now, of course, you must think the statistics in the picture of four, because a large number of these criminal cases against public representatives are those related to agitational offences. They're not real. But there is an alarm. For example, the last statistic shows that 1651 of these reason we have only 543 members of Parliament. Uh, 1651 cases against us, one of them relate to offences as serious as murder, kidnapping, and great terms. They all got into Parliament and assemblies. The second is, of course, the rule of law, because this is the point about rule of law. Plus, that's plus in what part and rule of law, I just find it's far from here about. So, the minus part also is an rampant corruption. India, with all the hype, continues to rank 85 out of 180 in the transparency internationally. So, that again is so why 
we are proud of being the only country in my for you in comparison to with our full wider Chinese democracy. I would still say that it's an imperfect democracy. There are lots and lots of miles to walk in Robert Frost's space before you come up to a perfect democracy. Nobody can do that. But to the approximation of perfection, which is what we all strive for in our 75th and 76th birthdays. Thank you so much. And then that. And so very much, that was a real tour de force. I've been shooting it absolutely wrecked. It was just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. We do have a few moments for a few questions before I turn to Professor Schultz for a bunch of sign. We have a rosy microphone, so gentlemen, and there, please, there. Do you introduce yourself? Hello, Picard. My name is Vipdal. And I'm a graduate of OB to the university, so thank you, Professor Lars, for having me on to be here. Uh, so with respect to the arrears, I have two questions. First, in the high end and second, data lower level. But with respect to the high level, do you think it is time that we establish a bench in the Supreme Court in the southern part of India, which is something it's going to talk for a long period of time, so as to include the access of justice in these areas? And secondly, with the lower, at the lower level, do you think it is time that or uh, something such as the uh, all India judicial services exam we set up as opposed to we've got it state uh, like way of judicial services so, so ensure that the gap is been and that all the lapses in the number of judges that are there it leads to that. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just in it could remain a bit yeah. Uh the answer to your second question is yes. The answer to your first one is no. Uh okay. <laughs> the all India judicial service is not a bad idea. Uh, it's something which brings in a lot of standardization, uniformity. There are disparities and discrepancies and anomalies when each state applies different standards. And uh, it's also a somewhat unfair progression for a trite young judicial officers who come to intrude in the exam. So I think. That's something which has been tried for a long time. Uh, it has moved towards the reformity and convergence, but it's still not a private support. It. The first one is supported by a large number of people, including the last intelligent delivery of Hawaii. Sounds attractive. I totally oppose it. Tell you why. I just mentioned to you that we possibly have 10 Supreme Courts functioning in the same building. In the same building. Some people say we have 16 Supreme Courts, but there are 16 four courts. Imagine what would happen if you had a Far East, Assam Ridge, a Deep South, Tamil Nadu, Chennai Bridge, the North, Shween Bridge, the West, and the Bath Bridge. What little vestige of consistency, the biggest hallmark of an apex court is integrity, consistency, uniformity, long term stability. It is already suffering. In a great way. I have the statistics to show the number of cases that have been reconsidered. And you have completely contrary judgments between two courts sitting in the same building. So clearly, sitting not in the same building but thousand miles apart, the US would be dust. On the contrary, in fact, that the view is that we, we cannot appropriate all armed because the numbers are just too large. But the view is that you must have some permanent benches of five. City per lock, we did a few other parts, city separate, but certainly not diffusion. I have the bat, an idea. Oh, now we have family. Hello, did you answer it? Uh, great evening, everyone, and it's absolutely it's an absolute honor to be present and uh, to be asking this question in front of so many distinguished get guests present over here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brahma Singh, for such an impeccable lecture. I am Admika and uh, I'm from OP General Bhuvan Law School. And the question is still boring, but it relates to the same thing. So my the first half of my question is, there are a lot of religious divisions that are being pioneered by the Nishri parties and they have been intensified over the past few decades. And they more than direct challenge, not just to the right thing, 
freedom of religion, but also to freedom of law and the and the mind. So in that context, what is the future of the Indian legal system and the essence of democracy? And secondly, um, as we all know, that the constitution guarantees to all of us um, the independence to the judiciary and the partiality of the judges. But uh, one of the unique models of the Indian framework being the separation of powers is not being uh, upheld in the recent times, if I may say so, because many recent decisions have been criticized on the grounds of echoing the government sentiments and not echoing the rule of law. So this makes a lot of people lose faith in the judicial system and access to justice. So what is the future of Indian democracy in these two contexts? Thank you so much. A question, uh, this is uh, easily the subject of the second torturous lecture of all the No, no, no. I said we will intend to do that. It's a very large question. But to answer it as concisely as I can, the first one of the question. Uh, in a diverse spot is India. The old concept of pluralism, inclusiveness, as I said in my lecture, it said, is parallel. It is not the favor I do to you. It is actually a favor I do to myself. It is actually completely self-preservating it because a country as diverse as India or including cannot be covered by exclusives. It can only be governed by exclusives. Number two, this is not the force doing in the first place. The force is only a reactive view. And to make it polarization, and let me tell you, irrespective of political power, there have been problems and there have been divisiveness and divisions in the Indian uh, context, which has to be a country as There have been across the board from 1950, and I would not blame individual government. But one thing I would unhesitate to is it. the degree of divisiveness, the degree of distrust, the degree of suspicion, the degree of impurity with which people who promote divisiveness get away. All that undoubtedly has exponentially increased in the last few years. There is no doubt about that. And that is about good for India. Having said that, no question raised to what the court should do. It is accompanied by some sense of fear. And I said, a degree of indirect uh, pressure by being appointments obstructing. The court has to institutionally and collectively rise about that. By and large, I believe that the court has acquitted itself most written over the last seven years. By and large. But it is individuals who make of the court. The court can do it only if larger and larger collectivities of judges realize this and rise above partisanship, their own personal predilections, religious conviction. Well, that's the whole meaning of that picture of a judge. To rise above all that. And I think there are enough tools in our constitutional setup, in part three own by Excel, which allow it to do it. And it has been done back again when they wanted to do it. When there is somehow a feel of avoidance, avoiding the issue, or competing of fear and problems of ice. And I think that is where, to me, the situation is this, that the debate is not how to check an excessively activist work. The debate is why is the court not more ex activist? We want you to do more excesses because the court is already very, very active. But the key is that you want the court to be even more excessive than what we call us of, of activists. So that's the sense of the more in which it should be. As far as your other question is concerned about the uh, about about a separation of power. A separation of power. Oh, yes. Uh, that's actually linked to this. Separation of power, as I said, is what I answered, that the court has to go largely by what they state is the right constitutional division of powers, coupled with what they think is the just result. See, the Indian Supreme Court has never gone textual. It has never gone by resilient edge. It has never gone by very small principles of interpretation. Its powers are vast. So it has to decide as in keyword with true justice the takes and then inside the hearing takes. That's what clearly the trust portion is based upon. That's what the people want. And I'm no doubt aberration, but 
You'll be better than me. Thank, thank you so much. It's always dangerous when we have students in the audience and they do ask the best and most probing question. But um, I'm very sorry, but we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I'm now going to invite Professor Van Schott, head of the School of Law at the University of Southampton, to make the, the closing remarks. Okay. It is that really bad that thing Colin. But. Hello, Dr. Singer, I'm a friend of Professor Rosh Marsh, which we've all met. Also, a general PhD of Professor Falcon, the internationalization and engagement at Southampton, as well as the Dean of AB Jindal, called C Lelva there is A year on. Um our esteemed guests, I'd like to well well, it's an it's an honor of the pleasure for me to do this vocal friends. I'm very shots in the school of Southampton Law School. And I just want to mention a few things. The first thing is to congratulate our esteemed speaker. Jenny referred to to the force. That was actually where I was thinking to be quite honest. Um, when you introduced sort of the, the presentation, you presented a sort of a question, and I thought that's really ambitious when you when you presented that presentation. But the, the way in which it responded in a thoughtful, measured, and meaningful matter was really, really impressive. We actually enjoyed this enthralling presentation that you gave. It was also interesting the way in which you've which have actually used uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, mantra of the future depends on what we do in the past. And I was quite interested in saving aspects and institutional aspects of the legal system in India. Really fascinating. So congratulations. And I think you can join me in congratulating you other. In, in the... Thank you. And then second, uh, second, Professor Raj Kumar for co-hosting and organising this very interesting event and the, the presentation. I think it's also a manifestation of the strategic partnership and the fostering of, of strategic relations between Southampton and the AOP general. Um, I'm looking forward to future collaborations. Just to mention, for instance, we are to esteem Dean and a delegation, I think it was the previous week, where we had lunch and we had really constructed discussions concerning future collaborations. So this is not really about talking about the matter, but we're really actioning and implementing um, these matters. We will have an international seminar soon, towards the end of the year, on the pedagogical aspects of international environmental or global environmental law in the era of the Anthropocene. So a very interesting uh, seminar and, and some other activities that we've also banned. So I'm looking forward to, to this as one of the facets or one of the aspects of the fostering relationship between our two institutions. Thank you very much for co-hosting this. Thank you. And then uh, Professor Falking for chairing uh, the, the debate and also to open on board. Professor Atherton, thank you very much for putting that in a very strict and efficient manner. Lastly, but not least, I would also like to Friend, we have Weinstein, Claire, Old, and the team at the back. We're about to wave the stone family. Our bed, our Weinstein law, actually, our bedrock at Southampton, and I'm always making sure that these, these events are managed and facilitated in a very uh, satisfactory manner. I'm not going to keep you any further. Um, once again, thank you for the presentation for our guests for your participation. For those of you who are going home, have a safe journey, and I look forward to future collaborations. Thank you very much.